So, hey, uh, one of the reasons I'm really excited today is because we are wrapping up our study in First Peter. Uh, I think there's something unique and special that happens when we as a church walk through an entire book of the Bible together. Now, we don't always do it that way, uh, but I think it's, you know, over the last like eight to ten weeks, we've just kind of chunk by chunk, verse by verse, going through First Peter. And what's been interesting to me, and hopefully it's been interesting to you, like I don't know about you, but for me, this has been challenging. There's times that what Peter has said has, has really challenged me or caused me to reflect on my own life. And, uh, but one of the things that's really interesting is as we've been walking through this is like how many times I think, man, like Peter wrote this letter to the early church like over 2,000 years ago, and yet it's almost like he could have written it to us today. Right, like Peter's writing to a group of people in a time of political and national unrest. In fact, as he writes this letter, Rome is on the verge of imploding from the inside out. And we, we get to kind of look backwards, and hindsight's always twenty twenty. that Rome will soon begin to collapse, not from the outside, but from the inside. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity for fear and for worry and for anxiety uh, there's a lot of reasons for people to isolate themselves, to no longer uh, be in community with other people. And at the same time, there's all kinds of people looking for answers, looking for hope, looking for a reason. And as Peter keeps writing and he keeps encouraging the church, don't forget that the, the passages that we've been reading are, are written to people who have been driven from their homes. Remember the way Peter starts. He says, hey, to the, the church in dispersion. That, that literally means to those who are, who are homeless, who have been driven away from their homes, that are now in new places that they never desired to live or wanted to go. He's writing to them. They are suffering for their faith. And what Peter told them last week is, is hey, church, hold on, because it's going to get worse. And I think one of the things that's really important for us to remember is that, that following Jesus well, I believe it's the greatest opportunity. I believe following Jesus is the greatest adventure that you and I could be on. Like, I wouldn't change following Jesus for anything, but don't forget that following Jesus comes with difficulty. And following Jesus comes with difficulty because we live in a broken world. Like, we live in a world that is hostile, opposing and does not honor Jesus. And so as we follow Jesus, we go against the tide of culture. We go against the tide of this world. Like one of the things Peter is going to remind us today is that we actually have a spiritual enemy. And so we should expect that following Jesus will come with certain levels of difficulty, not because of Jesus, but because of the opposition of the world. And as Peter is writing this letter, he's not just telling us how to survive. Like the point of this, of this letter isn't like, well, hey, just pull up your bootstraps, kind of get down to the nitty gritty, grin and bear it, and eventually you'll make it through. No, he wants more than that for us. Like really, he really wants is for us to know how to thrive in this kind of tension, how to, to live with hope and with joy in the midst of opposition, in the midst of conflict, in the midst of the world we live in. And in fact, what I think Peter wants us to be is overcomers. Now, when I say overcomers, I'm not saying that we would overcome in our own strength or our own might, that we're overcomers because Christ has already overcame, right? He's already conquered sin. He's already conquered death. He's already conquered the grave. He's already conquered the spiritual enemy. Paul talks about this and says we are more than conquerors, not because we're awesome, but because Jesus is our victory. And as Peter begins to wind down his letter, I think he gets really, really practical. In fact, I think what he kind of ends with is, hey, now that you know all of this, now that you know that you are exiles, that you are foreigners, that you are people who love God, that you have a citizenship in heaven, but you do not belong in this world, because you are people who are suffering and will suffer, but don't forget you have an eternal inheritance. Don't forget you have a living hope. Don't forget that God is with you, that when you suffer for Jesus, you suffer like Jesus, and there's a peculiar glory that you receive. Don't forget that when you go through the trials, that Jesus went through trials, and because he made it through, you'll make it through because of all of this. He says, here's a few things I want you to do. And it's probably not things that are intuitive to us. 
In fact, I would suggest to you that today in the culture and the time that we live in, what Peter is saying to them, I think is really, really practical to us. See, the first thing he he says is, hey, I, I want you to overcome, and I want you to live as overcomers in the middle of persecution, crisis, in difficulty, I think the first thing he's going to tell us is this, is, hey, Christian, find a flock. Now, what I mean by that is he's going to use this parallel of a sheep and shepherd. And what he's going to tell us is that it's really, really important for us to have a community that we belong to. Now, don't miss this, because sometimes what happens, I think especially in a sermon like today, as we're walking through a passage, you could think, well, the pastor's just saying whatever the heck he wants to say, right? Like, he's just, this is like free counseling, he's just saying whatever he wants to say, and we have to deal with it. But no, everything I'm telling you today, you're going to see is in the heart of God and directly from Scripture. These aren't my words, I'm just delivering the mail. But one of the things Peter's going to say is, listen, there is no such thing as churchless Christianity, like, and what he's going to tell the, the church is he's going, listen, it's really important, probably more important now than ever, that you belong to a community that you can't do life alone. And it not it so true that when life gets hard, the first thing we do is we begin to do life alone? Like our first reaction to difficulty, our first reaction to hardship, our first reaction to pain, our first reaction to conflict is to go, hey, I'm just going to back away a little bit because I don't really want anybody to know what I'm going through. I don't really want anybody to know that, that I'm not okay. I don't want anybody to know that I'm struggling. And yet what, what the scripture speaks is, no, no, when in those seasons, what you should do is dig into community. Don't back away from community because isolation always leads to desolation. And now, now here's the thing. I want you to see this because Peter wrote this thousands of years ago, and yet today, according to the CDC, due to this pandemic that we're in, that two out of five U.S. residents uh, report struggling with mental or behavioral health issues directly tied to COVID. This includes anxiety, depression, substance abuse, and suicidal thoughts. And I'm not an expert, so I'm just going to tell you what I'm reading, is the idea is, is this is going to continue to go up and to the right. That the longer we're in this, that the more and more people will struggle with this. By the way, divorce in America is up 34% since March. More and more people are ending their marriages and get divorced. The stats that I read said if you were married two years or less when the pandemic hit, odds are you will not survive your marriage throughout this pandemic. Alcohol consumption has increased. The Nielsen Reporting Group reported that 54% uh, increase in the national sales of alcohol happened at that week end of March 21st. So let me, let me put that in my own words. So when we said, hey, we're going into lockdown, people didn't go to Walmart, they went to the liquor store. 54% more alcohol sold just in a week because of the lockdown. Now, now why, why do I say all of this? I think, and this is me, this is just me, I think what the pandemic revealed is that we're not well. And see, what I think happened is is the pandemic, and whether you believe in it or don't believe it, whether you don't believe in the numbers or whatever, I'm just talking about what's happening right now. What it did was it took away our opportunity to distract ourselves and to medicate ourselves. And so what happened is, is now all of a sudden we're isolated and now all of a sudden we have to deal with our problems. We have to deal with the realities and we are not well. But here's the thing, right? We open up just two chapters in the very beginning of the Bible. God creates the world. He creates everything in it and it's all good, right? He creates the world. He creates the sun and the moon and the stars and it's good. He creates the land and the water and it's good. He creates the animals and the birds of the air and it's good. And then he creates Adam and Adam's alone. And then God says, It's not good that man should be alone. Now, the only reason I bring this up to you is because I think there's a biblical principle that says you and I are made for community. That you guys, we were made by a God who's Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So God, in his relationship, Father, Son, Spirit, the triune God, one God, three persons, in relationship, created us for relationship. And see, I think this is really important for us as Christ followers because we're created for relationship community. Like, listen, just read your New Testament. Your love of God and your worship of God is always tied 
to your love and treatment of other people. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And what Peter's reminding the church is like, listen, we're better together. We're built for relationships. Like, I don't want you to isolate yourselves. I want you to continue to live in community. And see, it's only in that context that we begin to understand what he says next. First Peter chapter 5, starting in verse 1, he says, So I exhort the elders among you, as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Now, I think two things are happening here. One we see immediately is that Peter is talking to pastors and leaders in the church that's ministering and caring for the people who are in dispersion. And he's saying, hey, leaders, love, care for, nurture, and feed the flock. Like, that's your job. Like, the job of any leader in the church is to care for people in the church. Now, when he uses the word elder, he's not talking to elderly people. What he's saying is, hey, for those of you who have been given spiritual authority, for those of you who are leaders, in the church. Now, now here's the thing that we can do is we can see a passage like this and we can go, well, like, I'm not a leader. Like, I don't have a title or I don't consider myself a leader. But really, I think what, what Peter is saying is for every single person in, in the local church, like, whether you are an elder or you aspire to be an elder or you're a ministry leader or you're a worship leader or you're a volunteer, like, what he says is true for every single one of us. And see, what I think he's saying is this, because don't forget, in the context, what he told us last week is, listen, prepare yourselves for the fiery trials. Like, they're coming, it's already hot, it's about to get worse. And then the very next thing he picks up is this idea of leadership in the church. And I think what Peter's saying is this, is that as crisis increases, so does the need for leadership in the local church. I think he's saying, hey, church, like, I know you're so worried about what's happening out there. But, like, take a self-assessment. Like, take some stock. Like, you know what's really important in the church when the world is on fire is leadership in the church. Because what happens is is, is there's this, this opportunity for what's happening out there to begin to influence what's happening in there. Like, we can turn on each other. Peter's already talked about that. We can begin to tear one another down. We can begin to fight over things that are, are non-essential. And he goes, listen, listen, church, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. Like, this is not a time to back down. This is not a time to back away. This is not a time to give up. He's saying, no, what the church needs is leaders. And I love this because, like, what we know about Peter is that Peter actually has a lot of authority in the church. And the reason that Peter has authority in the church is because Jesus gave him that authority. Now, I love this because sometimes, and I know I feel this way sometimes, is I think sometimes, especially when we talk about leadership or setting the example or serving, we could begin to say, like, well, how could God use somebody like me? And whenever I feel that way, I remind myself, well, if God can use Peter, then God can probably use me. On really low days, I remind myself, if God could speak through a donkey, then he might be able to speak through me. Right? And let's just talk about Peter for a second. Peter is loved by Jesus. He spends time with Jesus. He's discipled by Jesus. Jesus actually makes Peter the leader of the 12 disciples, which blows my mind. He includes Peter and kind of his small group of the 12, Peter, James, and John, that Peter gets included in all kinds of little events and opportunities that most of the other disciples don't get included in, right? Like, I think of Jesus being out, uh, walking on the water, and Peter goes, well, I'll try. He goes, come on, Peter. Only disciple that had that experience. Like, Peter gets invited by Jesus to the Mount of Transfiguration where, where, you know, they see Jesus exalted, they see Elijah, and there's this whole thing going on, and, like, Jesus actually kind of transfigures. He glows because the Shekinah glory of God is on him. Well, Peter's there for that. And don't forget this, because we, we miss this all the time. I'm going to preach a series on this one day. But there is a fine line between Judas and Peter. 
Right? Like, don't miss this. Like, it comes down to the final days, hours of Jesus' life. And they gather for the Last Supper. And it's different. And the whole atmosphere is different. And, and Jesus actually says, one of you is going to betray me. And Peter, surely not I, Lord. I mean, like, yeah. I mean, you know, Mark, maybe. But not me, right? And then Jesus actually tells Peter, like, hey, you're actually going to go through something. Like, I'm telling you that you're going to be shifted, which is not something you want to hear. Oh, surely not me, Lord. And then Judas gets up, leaves the table to go take action and betray Jesus to have him killed. And they go to the garden and pray, and Jesus asks Peter, hey, would you pray with me? Peter falls asleep. And then he has this big moment, right? Like they come to arrest Jesus and Peter takes out his sword and lobs off a guy's ear. Now, I, this isn't the Bible, this is me. I'm convinced that Peter was aiming for his head but missed. And then Jesus puts the, the man's ear back on and heals him. And then, and then Jesus goes and he's, he's given a false trial and he's mocked and he's beaten. And they begin to crucify him. And essentially a middle school girl sees Peter and says, hey, Peter, Aren't you with him? Surely not. No, I have nothing to do with that man. And three times, Jesus deni- or Peter denies that he knows Jesus. The third time, the Bible says he begins to call down curses upon himself. At this moment, both Judas and Peter have betrayed and denied Jesus. And yet the difference is, is that Peter has a repentant heart. Is that he realizes what he's done and he's actually heartbroken after it. And so Jesus dies, is buried, resurrects on the third day and begins to reveal himself to people. And he reveals himself in in different ways to different people. Then the resurrected Jesus has a conversation with Peter. And he begins to ask Peter, hey Peter, do you love me? He says, you know that I do. And he says, then feed my sheep. And Jesus asks him the exact same question. Hey, Peter, do you love me? And he says, you know that I love you. And he says, then feed my sheep. And then I think he looked at him again, maybe with a different tonal inflection. He goes, hey, Peter, do you love me? Peter's like, Jesus, I, you know that I love you. I'm, so, I'm sorry, you know that I love you. And he says, then feed my lambs. Now, I think this conversation and this charge that Jesus gives Peter is now what Peter is kind of using for this conversation. Because now he's talking about leadership in the church. He's going like, hey guys, like, I want you to know that you know that I have authority, that Jesus made me the leader of the church, and he made me the leader of the 12, and that he, for whatever reason he chose me, inspired by the Holy Spirit, to preach the very first Christian sermon, and 3,000 people get saved. It's the birth of the church, and it's like I'm all a part of that. Like You know that I could say just do it because I told you to do it, and you should, but he doesn't. He says, I want you to know that Jesus is the good shepherd and I am an under shepherd. He goes, I want you to know that I don't deserve to have the authority that I have, but it's a joy to serve you in the way that I can. And he goes, I want you to know that I have suffered for you and that I will suffer for you. I have suffered for Jesus and I will suffer for Jesus. So, so here's the thing. I want you to know, like, listen, the church needs more leaders. And then he goes, and by the way, Let me give you three reasons that you shouldn't be a leader. Because Peter goes, listen, I'm I'm not a leader for any of these reasons. I'm a leader because I love Jesus and he called me. He goes, so listen, don't become a leader from a, a sense of duty or compulsion. Do it because you're willing. Do it because you love Jesus and you believe that he's called you to do it. He's like, do not do it for selfish gain. Now listen, here's the thing about leadership is if you want to make everybody happy, you should sell ice cream at Baskin Robbins. If you're looking for some conflict, become a leader. And and there's all kinds of ways, like there's all kinds of ways that sinfulness can affect leadership, right? Like we could say, well, what do you mean selfish gain? Well, listen, nobody gets into ministry for money, by the way. Unless you're like one of those guys that bought yourself a personal plane in the last year. Like they, they may have, but like most of the guys I don't aren't talking about what kind of plane to buy. But there is things like a sense of power. You could get a sense of control. Maybe you could get a false sense of holiness. Well, I, I am a leader. 
sense of arrogance. You could make demands and see if people would follow me. He goes, listen, don't, don't do it for any of those reasons. But eagerly be willing to serve. Oh, and by the way, whenever you lead, you set the example for other people. Now you go, why in the world would you say that Peter's talking about community and leadership? Well, because without community, without a sense of I belong to a local church, like I don't think any of what Peter says makes sense. Like if you kind of take the modern American day version of Christianity, like, well, where do you go? Well, I go to a church sometimes. Do you know who the pastor is? Well, I know who taught on Sunday on the screen. Like, have you ever had a conversation with your pastor? No. Like, do you know any of the elders of the church? Well, I think one of them did a video update one time. Then none of this makes sense. Especially what he says next. 1 Peter 5.5, 5, Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. We're like, we're out. Nope, not doing that. But remember, Peter's talked over and over again about the attitude of submission, that even Jesus submitted himself. So like Jesus, we, we submit our, ourselves. He says, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves. This is literally the idea of putting on an apron is the word that he uses. He says, clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another, for God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. He says, listen, I think you need to be part of a community. I think you need to be connected. I think there's supposed to be a sense of commitment that this is my church. And listen, the church is not a religious organization. Like, listen, there's things that we do because of the culture we live in. Like, we have to have insurance. It's a law, but that's not the church. Like, there's bills that we have to pay, but that's not the church. Like, you would never say that your ComEd bill is your family. You would just go, listen, my family kind of likes electricity, so I pay the ComEd bill. See, the church is not an org chart. The church is God's people living together as a family for God's glory and for his mission. But just like every family, there is leadership. And what he's telling within the church is like, listen, God has appointed leadership in the church, not for control, not to be domineering, not to get selfish gain, but so that we could grow together and have some direction. And at the end of the day, someone has got to make the hard decisions, but he's going, listen, you need to know, like you need to be able to this question, who are my people? Who is my church? Who are my spiritual leaders? Who do I go to when I need prayer, advice, or wisdom? Who can I go to in the midst of our struggle? We all need to be able to answer that question. Now, I'll always be as honest with you as I know how to be. If you're like, well, do you want that to be here? Well, of course, because we love you. And for those of you that are watching online, we, we, we love you. And we think there's something significant about community and family. But sometimes people also take this verse and, and try to misconstrue it. But I, I think what Peter's also saying is this, is leaders do lead. Leaders lead. That's why they're called leaders. Like, I know this will strike people the wrong way, but I'm willing to say it anyway. Like, you'll notice in First Peter... Peter never asks for a vote on anything. He leads. And I just want to give you a snapshot. Like, I want you to hear, like, if you've tuned out and you're thinking about the football game later, just come back to me for a second. What I'm about to share with you, I am not sharing with you so you go, oh, poor Adam. Okay, that's not, that's my intent. I'm good. I'm good. I'm doing, I'm doing all right. Like, full transparency, doing all right. Like, have a pretty good life, pretty excited, a few things trying to change my own life, but I'm good. So I'm not looking for sympathy. Okay, But I just want to give you some stats because I want you to see why this is such a big deal. In the last couple weeks or months, I think it's been months now, Forbes listed pastoring as one of the most difficult jobs in the world. True story. Just so you know, pastoring right now is listed as one of the top three professions that lead to suicide. Like They're like, if you're a pastor, we'll just put you on suicide watch. Right now in America... 50% of pastors are looking for a new job in a new profession. Okay, now, now here's why I share this with you. I think the church is in trouble. Like, I think in the long term, I think the long term health of the church, like, I think what's happening right now is I think you're going to see less and less churches led by less and less people. Like, I think, I think Christianity, like, had its heyday in America, and I think there's, sur like, suffering, persecution, opposition. Like, I would be willing to say this, and I know we record it, and somebody will email me later. Like, I think cultural Christianity is dead. 
Like people who go to church just to kind of feel good about themselves, people who participate to go, hey, I'm a good moral person because I went to Christmas and an Easter service. Like I think that's gone in America. And, and I think that's actually okay. Like I think there's a refinement. I, I think there's a pruning that's happening. But what I'm saying is this. is like I think we're going through something, and the reason I bring it up to you is because the only way we can fix a problem is to first admit that there is a problem. And now here's the thing, like I believe in Jesus, right? I believe in the Bible. And so like the, the church is Jesus' idea. Jesus says the church is his bride. And so as long as he hasn't given up on the church, I'll never give up on the church. And like if Jesus is still in control, if he still has the whole world in his hands, which I believe he does, and I think the church is going to be just fine. But I do think we're at some interesting times. In fact, full transparency, one of my greatest joys over this last year in the midst of this COVID season, it has been to see a few people step up and dig in. Doing exactly what Peter talked about, being willing and eager, serving without complaining, wanting to nurture and protect and care for the body of Christ. Like It's been a joy to see a few people step up in that, like to go, hey, like we're watching and we're looking and we're seeing how people are responding and adapting and changing, and there are some of you that it's a great joy, and yet one of the saddest things has been to see the church scatter, take a step back, or to see people just kind of completely leave. And listen, I know there's health risk. I've told you since day one, be smart, be safe. There's some people who should not be here because of their health risk. And that's why we go the extra mile and we put resources online and we're releasing content online all the time. I don't think church can happen online, but I think there's elements of church that can happen online. So listen, we're not trying to guilt anyone and saying, hey, risk your life or become a super spreader. Or don't, don't think, okay? We want you to think. We want you to be wise people. And yet there's some people who like have just kind of been like, hey, we'll see you when this all is over completely stepping away, completely backed away. And that's hard. Like, it's a really weird thing to be a pastor and not know who your church is anymore. It's probably really hard to be a part of a church and not really know who your church is anymore. See, one of the hardest things about leadership is making hard decisions knowing that it will be criticized. This is kind of what leadership looks like, right? You pay the cross, you pay the cost, you make the sacrifice to sit in the chair that no one else really wants to sit in. And then as a, a part of that is you get to make hard, difficult decisions that no one else really wants to make. And then once you make those decisions, you get to live with both the consequences and the criticisms of those decisions. Oh, by the way, the people that criticize are usually people who have never paid the price or asked to have been sitting in the chair and will never have to live with a hard decision, but would like to inform you about how they disagree with your decision, usually through email. And yet what Peter is saying is, hey, church, we need more leaders. Like when the going gets tough, we need people to not step away. We need people to step up. And so let me take a minute. I want to thank all of you who have prayed for our church, who have prayed for our family, who have served and loved this local body of believers in this time. For those that you have given generously and faithfully, for those that you have stepped up and set up chairs and unloaded trailers that you've cleaned up and you've made the adjustments. For those of you that have watched online and shared online, for those of you who are building relationships and checking on one another and staying connected, thank you. Thank you for using your life, your gifts and your talents and your time and your abilities to continue to serve the church and advance the kingdom of God in this crazy time. And if you don't have a church, or maybe you're watching online today and you don't have a church, find a church, and it doesn't have to be this one. Listen, if you're stuck at home and you think, well, I don't know how to serve from home, like we're doing more and more online ministry, so there's all kinds of opportunities and options for people who are stuck at home to stay involved and to check on people and love people and to connect with people online. I see what Peter says next to you and me is 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6. He says, humble yourselves. Humble yourselves, therefore, under a mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Peter talks about leadership, and then he talks about love. Hey, can I just take a minute and remind you that God loves you? Like, I think sometimes we become so familiar with that that we lose the awe of that. But God loves you. 
In fact, I would go as far to say that God is crazy about you. In fact, this is what Peter wants to remind the church of, is cast your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Like, not only does God love you, he cares for you. You know, I'm not trying to get all touchy-feely, emotional, ooey-gooey. Like, this is the truth of the gospel. That, that you and I would be created by a God who loves us and cares for us and desires a relationship with us, but that we would sin and rebel against God. God is holy, 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 the beginning and the end. He is the just judge. And so he can't just wink at sin. He can't say, hey, you're bad, no big deal. No, no, he has to deal with it according to his character and his holiness. And so there has to be a price paid for sin, but you and I could never actually pay that price. So God sends his son his beloved son, his only son, his perfect son who comes in the flesh, our substitute, who would live the life that we could not live and die the death that we deserve. That on the cross, Jesus would take all the sin, all the shame, all the guilt, all the junk off of your account and place it on his account. And so that when he dies, he literally absorbs the wrath of God on your behalf. And like a sacrificial lamb, he dies as a sacrifice for our sins. And when he dies, so does our sin. He's then dead and buried, and he rises again the third day, victorious over Satan, over sin, over death, over our shame. So that we could be fully loved, so that the the sin would be gone, that the consequences of that relationship would be made new, that we could be fully loved, fully accepted, fully adopted sons and daughters of the Most High God, not because of anything we've done, but because of what, Christ has done on our behalf because he loves us. And Peter says, hey, what I want you to do is I want you to humble yourself. See, sometimes we, we think humility is like thinking less of ourselves. But humility is actually just thinking of ourselves less. Like I heard a story one time about a pastor visiting a church and as he got off the airplane, a deacon from the church was there, and the, the deacon was, like, you know, carrying the bags and serving the guy and, like, you know, wouldn't let him load and unload stuff, opened his car door for him, and the, the pastor looked at his deacon and said, man, you're, you're very servant-hearted. And the deacon replied, yes, I am, sir. I'm the humblest man I know. Nope. <laughs> Wrong. See, humility, humility is going, hey, like, I, I think what Peter means here when he goes humble is you go, hey, like, hey, God, I need some help. Like, hey, God, I'm not strong enough. Hey, God, I can't carry this anymore. Hey, God, if I could have figured this out, I would have figured this out already. Like, I, I need you. Let me, let me ask you this. Like, lean in for a second. What are you worried about? Like, for real, what are you worried about? What is it that's keeping you up at night? What's that conversation you keep playing in your head over and over and over again? Like, what's that doubt or that fear that you just can't seem to shake? See, Peter's invitation to you and to me is to actually take those things and to cast them upon God who loves you and cares for you. When he says the word cast, it's actually... It is more like the idea of hurling your weight onto something. It's kind of like the idea of taking a donkey or a pack mule and putting your luggage or your load, you would cast it upon that animal, and then once you take your hands off of it, the animal carries the weight. So he says, listen, I want you to load up your anxiety. I want you to load up your worry. I want you to load up that conversation. I want you to load up your doubt and your fears upon God who is able to carry them. And then here's the trick, and I'm terrible at this, so maybe you can help me in this area. He's saying, hey, once you put them on him, keep your hands off of them. Like, see, what I tend to do is I kind of load them up and then pray and then pick them back up when I leave. You know, hey, thanks for carrying that for a minute. That felt great, but uh, I'll, I'll help myself out, right? He's going, no, 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 you put that upon God. Like, you let it go. You cast your anxieties on him. And I think this is worship, right? When you cast your anxieties on him, it says that you're saying, hey, God, I trust you. I actually believe that you're God. I actually believe that you can do some things that I can't do. I actually believe that you're strong enough to carry these things. Like when we cast our anxieties upon God, what we're saying is, hey, God, we trust you with the promises that you've made to us. We trust that you will do all that you've told us that you will do. 
And we cast our anxieties upon him. We say, hey, God, we actually trust that you are the God that can make a way when it seems like there is no way. See, I think sometimes we make ourselves really, really big. And we make God really, really small. See, I believe that we still have a God who spoke and created the world. Like, I believe that we have a God that can still move the mountains. I believe that we have a God that parted the waters and he can do it again. Like, I believe that we have a God that closed the mouths of lions, that he delivered his people through the fire, that he delivered his people from Egypt. And if he did it then, he can do it again. Like, I believe that we have a God who overcame Satan, sin, and death. Like, I believe that the tomb is still empty and that matters for our lives today. See, what a time to live in. That we as Christ followers actually have the opportunity to live in such a way that we put our faith on display that we could walk saying, I have a God who is sovereign and he loves me and he cares for me and I trust him. And Peter says, so cast your anxieties upon God. He's got it. He's able. He loves you. And he will see you through. See, I think what Peter is telling us is that our choice is not will I suffer. Our choice is when I suffer, will I suffer knowing Jesus? Experiencing the hope, the joy, and the peace and the power that comes from him and him alone. Now, as Peter's wrapping this up, I think he's being really, really specific. He's saying, hey, get plugged in. Don't do life alone. Hey, by the way, church, now is the time that you need more leaders. And oh, by the way, you're thinking about church and living for Jesus and the culture you live in. Hey, cast your anxieties on him who cares for you. And you go, well, why would you say all of that? And then he gives us a hard reality. He says, be sober-minded, be watchful, Remember when I told you that Jesus asked Peter to pray with him? What did Peter do? Fell asleep. He's going, don't be me. Don't fall asleep. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking to devour. Peter goes, hey, church, don't forget there is a devil. You do have a spiritual enemy. And he does have a team of fallen angels that serve with him on his agenda. Oh, by the way, his agenda is to destroy you. Jesus says it this way in John 10, 10, that the enemy comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. That's his, that's his deal. That's his MO. That's all he does. By the way, they are organized, and they are strategic, and they are your enemy, and their goal is to destroy you and the local church. I love the way Pastor J.D. Greer says it. He says, the odds of being attacked by a shark is one in 3.7 million. And yet people still don't get into the ocean waters. Being attacked by a grizzly bear, your odds are one in 2.1 million, and yet people still buy bear spray before they go into the woods. Your chances of being attacked by a supernatural lion, however, are one out of one. And yet people still don't believe it is true. Don't forget what Paul says in Ephesians 6.12, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Now don't, don't miss this. When Jesus rose from the grave, the devil was defeated. But caged lions can still cause damage. Like, I feel one of my jobs as a pastor is to equip you for real life. See, sometimes I think we'll we'll talk about, well, the the devil's defeated, so he has no power. Well, that's not true. Like, he still has a strategy to get you. Like, a few years ago, we we took our kids to the Boone County Fair. for There was, like, a circus thing going on, and, like, they had all these lions and a lion tamer and tigers. and, And, like, there was just one tiger that they brought into, like, the cage circle, and this tiger was trying to kill the man. And, like, you know, I mean, he had his little whip, and, like, and they would kind of, like, make jokes about it. And you're like, this tiger is tamed and caged, and he has one goal, to kill the lion tamer. 
And so, like, they did their best to, like, move that tiger away from the other tigers. They, they like, did their best to kind of, like, lure him with steak into, back into the trailer. But this tiger would not go. And I'm thinking, this is, like, my kids are going to need counseling one day. So, like, hey, remember that time we took you to the circus and, like, a guy died because we watched the tiger eat him? Like, I, I share that with you. All, like, and he didn't die. Like, they, they got him in the cage. But here's the thing. Like, like you have an enemy. He's defeated, but he still has teeth. He's defeated, but he's still able to destroy. Like, he cannot steal your salvation. He cannot rob you of the Holy Spirit. He cannot steal your inheritance or your joy. He cannot prevent you from entering heaven, but he can entice you, lure you, and try to devour you. And you go, how? Well, it looks something like this. The first thing the devil loves to do is isolate you. Tries to get you alone. Tries to get you weak. Tries to get you vulnerable. Have you ever noticed that you're, you're, you're at your weakest point, at least I am, when you're tired, anxious, depressed, worried, feeling burnt out, and you feel like you're all alone in the world? The devil loves it when we're in that position. And see, in those moments, he steps in and he tries to tempt us, right? Hey, life is too hard. You deserve a break. Hey, make church optional. You don't really need those people. Hey, you don't need community. In fact, you don't need anyone. In fact, most people are stupid and beneath you and they're not good for you anyway. You know what? You do deserve some pleasure. You know what? Sin isn't that bad. You know what? The Bible is outdated. You know what? No one will find out. Like really, if it gives you pleasure in the moment, how can it be bad long term? Like listen, you should be the captain of your own life. God isn't real. He's dead. And then he begins to take a bite at a time. Luring you and tempting you and moving you one step at a time further away from God. Simply trying to get some space in your mind and in your heart where he begins to have influence. And then once he has it, he accuses you. How could you? What do you mean you're a Christian? I know what you've done. I mean, do you really believe God could love someone like you? I mean, do you really believe that you could still love God after all you've done? You're born again? I don't think so. You have faith? I haven't seen that faith. Where is your God now? And he gets you to try to question the goodness and the sovereignty and the love and the provision of God. He gets you to try to take your eyes off of Jesus so that you would walk away from Jesus, so that you would begin to doubt Jesus. And then he says this, resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, he himself will restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. He goes, hey, church, do not reject Jesus. Do not lose faith. We do not sin. We do not compromise. We do not run. We do not take the easy road. We do not become more like the world to be accepted by the world. Instead, we link arms together. We do life together. We hold fast to Jesus together. We encourage one another. We pray with and for one another. We cheer one another on. We have hard conversations and love with one another. So we grow up into maturity in Christ. We love, we trust, we worship, and we walk in joyful obedience to Jesus who is stronger than anything in this world. To say, church, Christ will restore, he will confirm, he will strengthen, and he will establish you. And then he says, because of that, to him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. When he uses the word of dominion, he means the power or the right of governing and controlling. He's talking about sovereign authority. He goes, I don't want you to forget, like, yeah, you have a a, a defeated lion who's after you, but don't forget to him be all power and all authority. To Christ and Christ alone be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. He's like, yes, in this life, in this world, you will have trouble, but don't forget that Jesus has overcome the world. And then comes this super weird verse, 12 and 13. 
<coughs> he says, by Silvanus, which is Silas. If you grew up in church, you know Paul and Silas, right? That, that guy. A faithful brother as I regard him, I have written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. She who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings. And so does Mark, my son. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Now, now I think what, what, what Peter does here kind of summarizing is he tells us in some ways how he's living this out. Like when he says that he's in Babylon, he, he's referring actually to Old Testament Babylon, but he's going, hey, the spirit of Babylon lives, and it lives today in Rome. And that's actually where he writes this letter from. So he goes, hey, I'm, I'm in Babylon, and the spirit of Babylon exists. But he goes, hey, but so does the local church. And the local church in Rome sends you greetings. Oh, oh by the way, so does Silas. In fact, he's, he's helped me with this. And Silas is one of the leaders in the other church. He does ministry with, with, with Paul, but he's also connected to Peter. And he's going, hey, by the way, I'm not doing life alone. I'm connected to other people. I'm, I'm digging into a church, and I have some other brothers. And he goes, hey, my, my spiritual son, like, hey, don't do life alone. So like, hey, I have a really special relationship with Mark. By the way, he's John Mark, who wrote the gospel of Mark. He goes, hey, I, I have a relationship with this guy. And like, hey, just love one another. Now, we live in COVID, so you probably shouldn't be kissing one another. But a fist bump, handshake, air high five. And he goes, listen, I want you to continue to love one another and do life together. So let me ask you these three questions. I know this was a long sermon anyway. Here we go. How are you doing? Like, really? How are you doing? So I want you to hear this. It's okay to not be okay. Just don't do it alone. Just don't do it alone. You need to be connected to other people who can love you, check in on you, encourage you, and be in your corner. Number two, let me ask you this question. Are you engaged, digging in, or have you retreated? Like, I can't answer you that for you, but you need to. I don't want to be the bearer of bad news, so don't shoot the messenger. I read an article this week that said, odds are the world that we live in right now lasts for at least another year. Even with the vaccines, in the trials, odds are all of 2021 looks like 2020. So, like, listen, sick of masks, sick of social distancing, sick of all that stuff. Yeah, me too. But, like, we've kind of been on pause, right? We've kind of been like, oh, this will pass. Oh, we're going to flatten the curve. Oh, we're going to get behind this. Like, I'm just saying, like, probably not anytime soon. So what I'm saying is we've got to figure this out. Like, we've got to start making some strategic moves in our own lives. Like, we can't wait. We can't just say, hey, we'll figure out this one day. We need to figure it out now and begin to live. Like, live in a way that gives God the glory. Live in a way that advances the kingdom. Live in a way that we can share our faith and still be safe and figure all that out. But listen, I think if the early church was praying right now, they wouldn't be praying for safety. They'd be praying for boldness because that's what they prayed for in those days. See, it's not time for the church to retreat. It's time for us to dig in. It's time for us to band together. It's time for us to form teams. It's time for us to come together for the mission and glory of God. It's time to see some leaders raise up in the church so that we can continue to be strong. Question number three, where do you need to take a stand against sin and evil in your life today? Peter says, hey, Satan's like a roaring lion. My guess is if, if I asked you the question, where would Satan attack you like a lion, you already know. So where do you need to take a stand? Like where do you need some help? Where do you need some accountability? Where do you need to set up some safeguards? Because it's not a question of if he'll come. It's a question of when he'll come. See, there's this old principle that I've heard spoken of that Maasai warriors who are lion hunters that when they know they're hunting lion, they actually group together. And they put their backs towards one another. And what they know is that the lion will attack one of them. And so when the lion comes, they surround the person that's being attacked, and they just fall on the lion with their spears. And so you can literally go and hang out with the Maasai tribe, and you'll find men with scars on their chest where they've been pawed like a lion. And if you ask them, you go, well, how did you survive? They just say, when the lion fell on me, my brother's, fell on the lion. Man, that's what the church is supposed to be. We don't shoot our wounded. We just fall on the lion together because Jesus is victorious. 
So listen, I think Peter's saying all this to, to not to be heavy, not to make us super serious. Like, I don't think this is supposed to be a doggy downer. I think he's saying, listen, I want you to thrive. Like, if anybody thrives in the conflict, if anybody thrives in the season, if anybody lives for the glory of God, if there's anybody that's like, man, how do those people have so much joy and peace and hope in the midst of this? It should be the people of God who have a relationship with God. So may we be people that live with a living hope.